first Sunday in Advent. And so Thanksgiving is behind us. Christmas is before us. And we're excited about what God has planned and what uh, God has in store for you and your family and his church right here. Amen? Amen. Amen. You ever been on a search for something you lost every day. every day looking for something some intense search that you've been on you're looking for something something that was lost and you were determined you were not going to give up until you found what you were looking for right and so now you've all are thinking about that lost dog or that uh, something that was lost, that you just kept on looking for and looking for. Uh, and it's, you know, simple things, right? Sometimes it's just the car keys. You look and you turn the house upside down. You look in your purse, you can't find the car keys. Uh, maybe it's the remote control you can't find or your glasses. You, I do that all the time, looking for my glasses. Where are they at? That deer that got away, you guys out in the woods trying to find, and you're on this big search. You know they're out there somewhere. Maybe it was a new job. You was looking, and you were searching for another job, a different job. Um, maybe you were searching for doctor, right? You needed a specialist or something, so you go online, and you, you, you do a search before you schedule your appointment. You were looking for something and you were determined that you were going to find what you were looking for. As we move into this Christmas season, you think about that. What are you looking for? Here we're starting off, moving into this time of year, very special time. What do you hope to find this Christmas season? And maybe you're looking for just traditional Christmas experiences, right? You're all about Christmas nostalgia. And so you're, you would be good, a little light snow, kind of falling sometime in December, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, maybe a little silent night playing in the background. You're kind of, that would be good for you this, this Christmas season. Or maybe what you're looking for is, something that you didn't find on Black Friday, right? You went Black Friday, you were on a search. You didn't find it, and so now here you are. You gotta find that, that special gift for that family member or that friend, and so you're still looking. Maybe, you know, we've already talked about Thanksgiving get-togethers, and praise the Lord, those Thanksgiving get-togethers were peaceful. Some of your Thanksgivings, maybe not so much. And so after all of those get-togethers, you're thinking, you know what, I'm just looking at Christmas time for some peace <laughs> and for some quiet. And so maybe that's what you're looking for this Christmas season. A long time ago, a mathematician named Pascal, he reminded us that we all have this God-shaped hole and we all have that desire in our hearts to, to seek God, to pursue God. But Pascal would say that we have this God-shaped hole in our lives. And we look for all kinds of things to fill that hole up. And we look to our job to fill that hole up. And we look for money or we look at things. We look for relationships that we have to fill up this God-sized hole. And his point was, nothing's going to fill that hole up except God. Amen. God is the only one who's going to fill that void and to fill that empty spot. And you can try, try, try to fill up with all kinds of other stuff, but it's never going to deliver it's never going to satisfy. There's always going to be a longing. There's always going to be a missing until you fill that up with the things of God. I think this time of year, this time of year, 
we're all wanting really the same thing. More of God. More of God. More of God, less of me. All right, that could be our prayer. Lord, more of you, less of me. And when you make Jesus leader of your life, and he comes, and he fills that hole up, then there's peace, and you're able to uh, thank God for his protection, his provision, uh, his purpose that he gives you in the story of God, that you have a part to play in the things that God is doing. I think we're all looking for more of God, more of his presence, more of his peace, more of his provision, blessings, favor, all of those things, but mostly we just want more of him. And so today and the rest of our time, we're going to look at some ways to do that. Uh, just some, some tips, if you will, on how you can have more of God this Christmas season, but not just the Christmas season. Uh, we can apply this to our lives uh, every day. Again, more of you, less of me. And we're going to look at a familiar passage of Scripture. It's really a Christmas story, and we're going to be talking about the Magi. Right? We know them as the, the three wise men, although the Bible doesn't say that there was just three. Uh, there could have been several magi, several wise men. We say three because of that's how many gifts they brought, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the magi were on a search. They were looking for something. And so we're going to use that story today to help us draw closer to the things of God, and so that we can experience, again, more hope, love, joy, peace, more of Christ this Christmas season, because, right, Jesus is the reason for the season, and so we want more of Him. Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to land. If you want to uh, pull that up, um, Matthew chapter 2, going to start off with the first three verses when the Magi went searching for Jesus, and God's word reads, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And so here we have the Magi. They were a combination of astronomers and astrologers. They were astronomers in the sense that they studied the night sky, and they kind of mapped out for them what they were looking at. And they were astrologers in the sense that they believed that what they were looking at in the night sky really meant something that the stars and all the things that was going on in the night sky, that that was really pointing towards something, that there was meaning in that. And in the ancient times, it was believed that a new star, whenever a new star appeared, that meant to them, they believed that someone of significance just came into the world on planet Earth. And so they believed that when a new star would would appear in the night sky, that, that maybe some, some king would be born, somebody of prominence, somebody very important had just come to planet Earth. And of course, we know that God put that new star, that star of Bethlehem in the night sky to guide the Magi uh, to Bethlehem, and ultimately that that star would guide them to Jesus and that they would find what they were looking for. Three tips from the Magi that we can take with us and learn as we um, want more of God in our lives. Number one would be do what the Magi did and ask some questions. Uh, not just any questions, but ask good questions. We need to be more like the young kiddos when it comes to asking, asking questions, um, 
kids come up with the, some of the best questions, don't they? Amen. Um, they come up with some, some great ones about life, come up with some great questions about God. I mean, you sit down and you talk to, to a child for very long, and they just come up with some great questions. We talked about that over Thanksgiving, about how you know, kids just have some, some great questions, and particularly about God. And you go away from that and you think, wow, and I'm like, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Uh, like when a, uh, a, a young kid would say something like, <clears throat> you know, my mom and dad tells me that <clears throat> I was made by God. Right? Mom and dad tells me I was made by God, but a kid in my class, they said that their mom made them. So... How's that work, right? God make me, mom make me, good question, good question. And then kids will oftentimes say, you know, we know when Jesus was born, but when was God born, right? We know how old Jesus is, but how old is God? Good question. And all those questions that they ask, that's how they learn, right? You t- uh, it's, been, it's, been, uh, it's been said that on average... Kids typically ask around 73 questions a day. 73 questions a day, and I know some of you are thinking, <laughs> no way. The kids in my family, they ask a whole lot more than that. And, uh, and I can testify to that. We have, we have Easton, and he can ask 73 questions at the breakfast table. I mean, just boom, 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 boom. Just, just one right after another. Uh, but you know what? That's how they learn. Right? That's how they learn. Start at like age three, uh, start asking questions, and it's good for them. That's how you know that they're, they're growing, and they're learning, and they ask questions, and they get these answers, and that's how they grow. Somewhere along the line, the adults, and that goes for me too, um, do you notice yourself not asking as many questions? We tend to not ask very many questions. Um, you know, and, and I don't know what that is. We, we get older, and I don't know, maybe we think we, we know it all, right? We know it all, and so we don't have to ask any, any questions. Um, maybe it's because we're too busy. I just don't have time. I don't have time to, to wonder I don't have time to wonder about how that was made, or I don't have time to wonder about what the, 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 the best way to do this. I, I just don't have time to ask questions. According to our verse today, there in verse 2, the Magi entered Jerusalem with a question on their lips, and it just wasn't any old question. I mean, it was a good question. They roll in there, and verse 2 says that they ask, Where? Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star. Now where is he? And it was because of their question that they ultimately found the one they were looking for. And again, we call these the magi, these wise men, and we call them wise in part because they ask good questions. They were humble enough, right? They were humble enough to acknowledge that they still had some things to learn. They didn't know it all. There were some things that could be learned by asking a few questions. And so they, in humility, came with this question on their lips. And so it is with us. We could ask lots of questions, and particularly when it pertains to God. What is God like? Um, you know, who is it that, that makes it possible for, for me to have a relationship with God? Is, is everything that the, uh, the Bible says, is it, is it true? Can I trust the Bible? What is the big story of God? And, and what part do you play in the story of God? All those are great questions if you ask those questions. And when you ask those questions, God will answer. And that's the good part about that. Ask God those questions, and He will answer. And it's an opportunity, really, for you 
by asking questions to draw closer to Christ. And again, I think that's, that's what we want. That's our hope. More of God, less of us. So if you have questions, God is the one to answer them. And who knows, maybe you get back to asking about 73 plus questions every day. But I would, I would ask you, don't bombard just one person with those questions like my kid does me, right? Spread it out. Spread, spread it out. Ask some friends. Ask some family. Ask God with the questions that's on your heart. And God is faithful, and he will give you insight on those questions that you have. And so that's a great way, a great way to, to have more of God in your life. Another way is to just pursue Jesus. This is what the Magi did. They pursued Christ. You pick it up in verse 4 there. It says, uh, when he had called together all the religious leaders and teachers, this is King Herod, okay? King Herod, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, that you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. And so the teachers of the law, right, they knew. They knew what the prophets had said about the star, and they, and they, they knew what was going to happen in Bethlehem, Micah, the prophet, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, tells them that, that this is what's going to happen. And of course, King Herod didn't like that. He didn't want another king to rise up. And so he wanted to eliminate the competition. King Herod didn't want any other king. He wanted to be king, right? It's good to be the king. And so he wanted to be the one and only king around. You go down to verse 9. It says, After the Magi had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They pursued Jesus. And they found him. The Magi eventually found what they were looking for. Scripture doesn't tell us how long it took them. Right? They traveled a long distance doesn't tell us exactly how long that trip took them, although verse 11 does say they came to a house where the child was with, with his mother. So apparently Jesus and Mary and Joseph had left the stable, and now they were in a house. So we're not sure how many months had passed before they arrived to see Jesus, but the important thing is they made it. They made it to Bethlehem. They made it to see Jesus. And close enough, close enough to where we, we still put them in the nativity scene, right? Um, close enough to put them there. They made it. They pursued Jesus and they found him. The Bible says it's the same for us. If we pursue the things of God, if we pursue God, that we will find him. And he, that's his desire for you for you to know him, and um, for you to know what he wants from you. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you. And again, the Magi searched some 400 miles through the desert to find Jesus. And so the question to us, what are we doing? What are you doing in your life to find more of God? What are we... What are we willing to do? Right. What are you willing to do to draw closer and closer to the things of God? 
Now, oftentimes, we, we wait to, to really pursue the things of God. We wait until we find ourselves in a, in a pickle, right? Trouble comes, crisis comes, loneliness comes. Um, something happens in our life, and that motivates us to pursue the things of God. But I would suggest pursue Him every day, right? Pursue Him every day. Uh, when things are going great, things are working out, um, seems like you're hitting a home run with everything that you do, and life is going great, right? You had a great Thanksgiving, no drama, <laughs> everything really working out for you. Pursue Jesus. Amen. Pursue Jesus. But also, certainly when things are going sideways... Things aren't working out. It's just disappointment, disaster, crisis, uh, confusion, chaos, all those things. Definitely pursue Jesus because we know the Bible tells us time and time again, cry out to God and God is faithful. He will deliver you. He will rescue you. And so pursue Jesus in the good times and in the times where we struggle think this is what Joseph did. Um, Joseph had a choice early on to pursue God or to run away from God. He could have went his own way and he had a choice and you remember the dilemma that Joseph was in. He was engaged to Mary. Mary tells him that uh, she's with child and the child belongs to God and he had a, he talked about a lot of questions Joseph would have had a lot of questions. <laughs> now, how's that work, right? And he did, and he asked those questions, but he was wondering in his mind, wow, what's other people going to think? What are the questions that other people are going to be asking me? What's my family going to say? What's my friends going to say? Uh, what, what's my friends, and what, are my fa what are they going to do about this dilemma that I find myself in. Can I even deal with this? And so J Joseph decided that he was just going to disappear. And you remember the story. He was just going to break off the engagement. Didn't want to bring a lot of drama to Mary. Wasn't going to blame her. He was just set in his mind and in his heart. I'm just going to disappear. I'm just going to go. But Matthew says that Joseph was a righteous man, that Joseph trusted God. And I always thought about that. If you ever want to, want to know if you're righteous, just ask yourself, are you trusting God? So that's how Joseph knew he trusted God and he was right with God. And just when Joseph had decided he was going to end things with Mary, I'm going to go, that very night in a dream, God sent an angel to Joseph, and it's recorded to us in Matthew chapter 1. It says, After Joseph had considered all of these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And it's interesting to me that the angel tells Joseph the same thing that he tells you every day. Don't be afraid. Right. Don't be afraid. Trust God. Don't let, don't let fear grip your life and control your life. Don't let fear keep you from enjoying all the blessings that God has for you, the hope, the peace, the love, the joy, don't let fear rob you of your hope. Verse 23 goes on and says this, says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. So you had Joseph. He has some options, kind of, world crumbling around him, things unraveling, he can turn toward God or he can run and turn away from God. Joseph chose to pursue God. Joseph chose to trust God. 
Joseph chose the better way, and I think that's the important thing. Joseph chose the better way. It wasn't the easiest way. It had been a whole lot easier just to probably disappear and to go on and do his own thing. But Joseph chose the better way. Joseph chose to trust and believe in God. And, of course, that's, that's why Joseph, he is in the manger scene. <laughs> he was definitely there through it all. Several years ago, a Christian group called For Him, this was a, several years ago, but they came out with a song titled, This is Such a Strange Way to Save the World. Some of you might remember that, that song. Such a Strange Way to Save the World. Rascal Flats, they, they covered that as well, and they made it a little bit more popular. And I'm not going to sing it, obviously. But... The, the, the chorus of that song uh, talks about this Christmas story really through the eyes of Joseph. As Joseph goes through this, from the perspective of Joseph, as Jesus is coming into the world, the chorus of that song says this, and you might remember this, Why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him with all the rulers in the world? Why here, inside this stable filled with hay? Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. Now I'm not one to second guess what angels have to say, but this is such a strange way to save the world. And yet, that's exactly what happened. Jesus would become the one who would save us from our sin. And so if we really want more of God, we have to pursue Jesus. And it's that same prayer, more of you, less of me. Jesus said nobody comes to the Father except through him. And so the work and the person of Jesus Christ makes it possible Having more of God finally means a total surrender, right? A total surrender. If you want more of God this year, at any time in your life, surrender it all to Christ. We go to verse 10. On coming to the house, the Magi there, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and what did they do? They bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so finally, they've been searching, they've been looking, they finally found what they were looking for. They see Jesus, and it's always, always fascinated me, they bowed down and they worshipped, and nobody had to tell them to do that. No, it wasn't a script, it wasn't... You know, is this etiquette? Is this the right thing that we should do? What should we do here with everything that's going... They didn't have anything to go off of. They saw Jesus and they just immediately bowed down and they worshipped. A total surrender to King Jesus because that's what they... They were in the presence of the king and so they offered him gold and frankincense and myrrh and all of those things meant for a king very expensive gifts fit for a king and in your life in my life we surrender to king jesus right we surrender to king jesus it's again it's a taking taking you off the throne of your life Put in King Jesus on the throne of your life, and you say, nothing is hidden. No secrets, nothing is hidden, nothing is off the table. Everything that I have, every area of my life, I give over to you. A total, entire surrender. Again, not my will, but your will. Less of me and more of you. And again, not just at Christmas time, but I think we're all thinking about what is it? 
what is it that you're hoping to find as we move into the Christmas season? What are you hoping to find Christmas Day? And God has put that desire in every heart to pursue Him. And I think we can draw closer and closer to Him, asking some really good questions to God. We pursue Jesus with all of our heart, not just kind of, sort of, every once in a while, but we really pursue Jesus with all of our heart. And then we say, yes. We put our yes on the table and say, total surrender. Every area of my life is to you. And I want to just give my life to you. Everything that I am and everything that I have is for your honor and for your praise and for your glory. And Maybe that can be our prayer today as we close. I want to close with a word of prayer, but after we have a time of prayer, I'm going to ask our musicians to come back up, and we're going to close with a song in our chorus book, uh, 73, a song that we're uh, familiar with, He is Lord. But before we do that, let's just have a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your many blessings and your favor. Um, we thank you for going ahead of us and removing obstacles, clearing the way for us. Help us to trust in you. Help us to grow our faith. Um, help us, Father, to want more of you in our lives. Help us to be open and honest to you. Help us to ask you... Uh, just anything that's on our heart, that's on our mind. We ask that you continue to help us to, to search for you, again, with all of our heart. Help us to surrender every area of our lives to you, that we just say, here I am. I'm putty in your hand. Use me the way that you want. We pray that you would give us the tools and the resources that we need to go and to do the things that you want us to accomplish. We pray your Holy Spirit would move in us and through us, would be around us, so that we would be, uh, be driven to the things of God. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to